Good evening. I'm David Uwe, Executive Director of the Chinese American Museum DC. Uh, we're the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. Uh, thank you for joining us for a discussion with Mei Nai, the author of the award-winning book, The Chinese Question. This is part of the 1882 Foundation's Timeless Echo series and the Museum's Meet the Author program. Uh, it's made possible through the generous support of Panda Express. So we have about a thousand people registered for tonight's event, and others are watching on our live stream on Facebook. And uh, for those that missed this or would like to see it again, a recording of this will be posted as, a, as we always do on our YouTube channel. So a great friend and partner of the museum, Ted Gong, will start our conversation. Uh, he's the executive director of the 1882 Foundation and president of the DC chapter of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. Uh, before retiring in 2012, and retiring is not a word I usually think of when I think of Ted. Uh, he was a career diplomat in the US Department of State where he served primarily in East Asia on policy and operational issues uh, related to border management and security and migration, refugees and consular affairs. Uh, Ted has been named to the Frederick Douglass 200, which is a list of 200 people, uh, abolitionists, diplomats, writers and more who best embody the spirit and work of Frederick Douglass. So uh, as always, a pleasure. Ted Gong. David, you're always uh, very generous in your sort of introduction, so I appreciate that very much. But I want to thank very right off uh, uh, all the people that made it, these kind of presentations possible, especially Lu Luisa in the background watching your chats. I hope that you use the chat function throughout, ask questions, and we'll try to integrate that into the conversation. Uh, David, me, Prakash, even May, if she has a chance to, <laughs> will be watching, but certainly Luisa's there, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge her. Uh, May, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce first, uh, I'm going to introduce Prakash first, and then uh, we'll get to May, and then we'll get into the questions. I hope it's a conversation that is among all of us, including you out in the audience. Uh, so Prakash, Katri and I go way back in the immigration, immigration area. It feels like almost like the Jurassic period when we first met. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, Prakash is an immigration, practicing immigration expert. Uh, he's had a dedicated career uh, in the process of understanding and resolving problems faced with the indiv individuals face, corporations or law, and other things that deal with the U.S. immigration related issues. And, He's had a strong international background. Uh, I think he grew up in Africa. Uh, so that's something to uh, consider. And he has a very strong practice and ties to, of course, Southeast Asia, India. He's a uh, uh, US immigration system is really complicated. But you know, he was uh, at the Disney Corporation for many years. That's when I mm -hmm. first met him and doing international visas and migration with that large corporation. And, and uh, he is, was also appointed by President George W. Bush to be the first USCIS ombudsman, which I was his, the first set deputy for him. <laughs> so I appreciate his, uh, his, uh, his confidence in sort of getting us together on, on, uh, on the USCIS when it was just forming. But in that process, we also worked on immigration policies, very much about how to do immigration reforms, Actually, I didn't even remember the several ones from 76 all the way to the current ones that are going on today. So he adds that dimension to, uh, to this conversation, which we want to get into. But the person that is most uh, important here is uh, Professor Nye, and she is an American historian and the Lung family professor of Asian American studies, and of course, a professor at the Hist of history at the Columbia University. Her topics focus on nationalism, citizenship, ethnicity, immigration, and race in the 20th century and United States history. I think she's become more and more the go-to, 
at least for me, the go-to person on immigration commentary and, and, uh, and opinion about things that are going on and in the past. She's written a huge amount of material, both in newspapers and articles about immigration issues, She's publisher of several books, and uh, among them are the uh, uh, Impossible Subjects, uh, Lucky Ones, which is a uh, one family extraordinary invention of Chinese in America. I think that that's a very interesting book. You ought to pick it up and look at it. The, uh, and the current book, which is really a very ambitious book. I think it covers a tremendous amount of history and details and understanding of what's going on and nuances of, of immigration and the Chinese American question. Uh, and that is one of the issues we're going to look at very closely. What is the Chinese American question? But before we get to that, uh, I'd like to ask May if she could uh, uh, just explain how did you write this book, which goes into so much detail about the gold rush periods in three different countries, uh, areas, uh, U.S., Australia, and in South Africa. May, can you uh, explain to us what motivated you to write this right. book? Right. Well, first, I want to thank the 1882 Foundation and the Chinese American Museum in D.C. for having me tonight. It's a great honor, and it's always great to be in conversation with you, Ted. This is not our first show together, and I hope it's not our last. Um, so why did I write this book? Well, it happens, as with many things, for those of us who teach, it was in response to a student. I had a student at Columbia who was writing a paper about politics in California. And he wrote that the Chinese were coolies. That is that they were indentured workers who are like slaves. And I knew that wasn't true, but I found it really difficult to correct him because this myth is deeply embedded in the history books, at least since the 1960s. And this is based on um, a bad use of sources. Uh, what I mean by that is that this one particular historian cherry picked quotes from thousands of pages of testimony before the US Congress about Chinese. He just cherry picked the ones that supported his argument that the Chinese were not free people. And he ignored all evidence to the contrary. And this got just repeated by people after him. Um, and the evidence, there is evidence to the contrary, but it's a scattered. Um, the California sources are not that easily um, uh, mind, shall we say, um, and, and they were just ignored. Uh, the evidence was ignored by others. So my goal in setting out with this was to slay the Cooley myth. Um, and, and to me, that's important because by likening Chinese workers to slaves, um, this myth painted the Chinese as a servile race, having no humanity or individuality or agency hopelessly unable to understand or practice democracy. And so this is the basic rationale for exclusion for why Chinese can never be assimilated because they're not a free people. Mm -hmm. So to slay the Cooley myth to me was both an empirical challenge and a question of political analysis. Uh, you know, the, that's, you know, the idea that Chinese were Cooleys and all that implies it's actually something that wasn't universal when migration or labor migration or movement came either to the United States at first or to Australia even. Right. The idea was they were a good, strong, reliable labor force. Then coolism, coolism sort of became the norm. How did that happen? <laughs> well, you know, in both California and Australia, which had a, a gold rush similar to the California rush just a few years later in the early 1850s, in both places, the gold rushes took place, you know, on the fringes of society, of the country. These were um, uh, the settler frontiers, and they became very quickly uh, international contact zones. People from all over the world showed up. Uh, not just Chinese, um, but also white Americans, Europeans, people from Latin America, from Hawaii. Uh, the Australians went to California. There are Californians who went to Australia. So, um, so there's this really kind of fevered atmosphere of competition and people from all different backgrounds mingling together. 
And in California, the white American miners um, were competitive with all other nationality groups, all other ethnic groups. It wasn't just the Chinese. They fought with the Mexicans. They fought with people from Chile. They fought with people from France, from Australia. And this was a kind of um, using, using nationalism or nativism as a competitive weapon, right? It's all for us, it's not for you. Mm -hmm. But it, it became fixated on the Chinese by the early 1850s, because even though they drove out a lot of other Europeans and, and Latin Americans from the gold fields, the Chinese were kind of late to come. And so by the time they came, a lot of the other groups had gone. And the idea that they were coolies actually didn't originate in the gold fields. It originated in California politics in Sacramento. Uh, by the first governor of California, John Bigler, mm -hmm. who in 1852 was in a tight race for re-election. And he used this idea that Chinese were coolies as a way to appeal to grievances among the white miners, because by the early 1850s, the easy gold that you could just pick up or easily pan out of the rivers was gone. And so there was, um, people were making less money, they were anxious. And so Bigler took a page out of the nativist playbook. You know, you appeal to a grievance, you offer people a theory of racial difference as an explanation, and you weaponize that for partisan gain. And that's how the Cooley idea, you know, it was a kind of racial shorthand to compare Chinese to slaves in the American South, and secondarily to indentured Asians in the Caribbean. Right, because there was the use of indenture there after the abolition of, of African slavery um, in, the, in the British colonies. It also seems like in, in the 19th century, the number of Chinese in America was so relatively small. So that, you know, they're probably concentrated labor groups that may have had contact with uh, Chinese laborers, but probably the majority of people had never even met uh people that's of, right descent. so you know probably just further that myth too that of people that you you didn't even know right you know what i find interesting is that um you know not every not every american miner was a racist just like today not every white person's a racist right and so difference has to be created or the sense of difference has to be created and has to be um, kind of constructed as something dangerous. And that's what the politicians do. The politicians do that. And then there are pundits that pile on and even intellectuals who offer deeper theories of this difference. Um, and then it becomes an explanation for people to, for people to explain that which is not easily explained otherwise. But there were, you know, there were whites that worked with Chinese that were, befriended them. Um, I came across people, uh, white miners, who, um, who were helpful to Chinese or who considered them to be neighbors. So I think it's also important to understand that it wasn't like, um, maybe at times it felt like a race war, <laughs> but it wasn't, um, you know, to me, one of, the, one of the takeaways in my book, I think, is that racism is something that's historical and political. It's not some... Um, so-called human reaction to people that look different than us. Mm -hmm. right. And um, it has to be, it has to be created and, and weaponized. And so if we can understand the historical and political origins of racism, then maybe we have a hope <laughs> to right. understand its causes today and to combat it. You know, if we think it's just human nature, then then we're just doomed. You know, I look at, I've, I've looked at that political cartoon from Thomas Nast you know, the Chinese question so many times before, but after reading your book, I looked at it again, and I always knew that he was a fairly progressive person, uh, and, and his, his, the ideas in his cartoons are pretty progressive, but I really took a second look at it, and, and you know, I kind of saw the empathy that he had for uh, the Chinese in his, in that particular cartoon, and I'm not sure, right. did that cartoon actually coined the phrase or was it did it already exist at the time no it already it already oh, okay. existed it already existed but you're absolutely right it's hard to read that cartoon but if you if you're right if you study it it's got uh, the main figure is um 
Columbia, right, which is stands in for the Constitution, mm -hmm. trying to protect this huddling Chinese man. Right. I mean, he's kind of abject, so that's not so great. But, you know, she's trying to protect him from a mob of ruly Irishmen. <laughs> and right. that, that character, that character, the Irish, is also kind of racist. But, mm -hmm. you know, he's, um, uh, you know, she is um, standing between the racist mob and the Chinamen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the bottom it says, um, hands off, gentlemen. America means fair play for all men. That's you know, a fairly progressive thought yeah. at the time. Yeah, exactly. And that's 1870, what, 1870 something? I think. Yeah. 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 You know, one, one of the things I want to get into before we start getting into the other countries, like uh, the other gold mines and uh, gold fields and stuff like this, is your, your mention of the, uh, of the connection to slavery in the United States, right? And I remember one of the conversations that we have had before where we were we kind of, you, you had said something in the lecture and it just sort of struck me that a lot of people like Governor Bigler and all these people were sort of like refugees from the South, right? The defeated South. And what they did was they brought with them all the attitudes they had since the start of slavery in the United States, right? And then uh, with the with after the Civil War or the realization that the war is going to be over and they're the wrong side, they started all moving over to California and bringing with them these different attitudes, the same attitudes they had. So later on, it becomes more of a, even a sharper labor issue. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how those attitudes <clears throat> developed out of the slavery and then the inability to use Blacks for African Americans for their labor issues affected uh, sort of the Chinese in California. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because I think often um, when we think about um, Chinese American history, especially on the West Coast, um, we don't think about the national context enough, right? And so actually Bigler's um, famous speech was in 1852. That's before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And he actually came from Pennsylvania. So let me explain how he has this racism, right? Because California is, um, we have to understand California as being settled um, in the context uh, by whites, right, from the East Coast, um, in the context of the sectional battle over slavery, right? That, the North wants more states and the South wants more states. So they keep expanding to try to get more states so they can control the Congress. And, um, and that's what fuels, that's the politics that fuels Western expansion. And the ideology that fuels Western expansion is this concept of manifest destiny, which is that the West belongs to white people. And so it's, a, it's the rationale for dispossessing indigenous people and, and curiously in, in the West, even when it's settled as free territories, right? Not slave territories, but free territories. Oregon, for example, is set up as a free territory, uh -huh. but their constitution forbids any blacks in the, in the territory, free or slave. Mm. And when California becomes a state in 1850, it declares that all Blacks in the state, including free Blacks, and there were some, not a lot, but there were some, it declares them all to be fugitive slaves. So there's a, a, a racist side to what in American history we call the free soil movement, the, the anti-slavery politics um, that becomes the Republican party. This is before Lincoln. Right, so they don't want slavery, but they don't want black people either, and they don't want Chinese people. So there's um, a very deep-seated kind of racial view of what the West is for, who it's for, who it's not for, um, and Chinese become the largest non-white group in California by by the 1860s. Right, I mean there there are some Mexicans, the native people are being killed off by the US Army and by vigilantes. So the Chinese become a kind of um, threat to this idea of manifest destiny and that the West is for 
whites. It's not, it's not so much that they don't have black labor and they, they don't, they don't like, they just want white labor. <laughs> and, um, and, and so this becomes, uh, and so I'm jumping ahead here, I'm jumping way ahead, but if you, if you think about Chinese exclusion, when it gets passed in 1882, right, this is your expertise, when it gets passed in 1882, it's already 30 years after the gold rush. Yes. And it takes that long for people in California to have a, um, uh, a kind, the kind of wherewithal, the political clout in Congress to get this bill passed. First, they have to overcome a treaty between China and the US, the Burlingame Treaty that allows for free migration between the two countries. They have to get that treaty revised. And then they have to get the votes in Congress. And so where do the votes come from for Chinese exclusion? The South and the West. It's not a unanimous. It doesn't pass you know, Congress uh, unanimously. A, you know, Martin Bowman. Yeah. Oh, no. Those are, those are the two bastions of white supremacy in the, in the country. But and today, know, too, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, I was thinking, you know, Martin Go talks about that in his, his great book. Uh -huh. And the South <clears throat> and the West were the advocates for the 1882, but it really didn't get the national ability to be nationally voted in until it became a presidential election issue in which you drum up support from, as you say, Pennsylvania or all these other states that were supposed to be pretty what we call liberal today, but the, uh, but uh, so that's where, that's where uh, jumping ahead again, where the Chinese question became weaponized by political people on political right. things. But I, I, I wanna ask you another question that maybe uh, Prakash can jump into and David also, is that, um, you know, it seems very, con if you look at the Australia situation and, and the South Africa situation you talk about, uh, what it's almost like a very conscious vote <laughs> that occurred to say we're going to have a white Australia policy or in South Africa, you have the Transvaal government in 1907 says we're going to do this. And it's very consciously saying this country shall be white, right? Was there a sense of that? Uh, of course, we know manifest destiny, but we don't say it's man. We don't overtly say it's manifest destiny for white, white but the, was there such a conscious decision to say America would just be white, right? As it was so starkly stated in, say, uh, the, uh, the Australian situation and then the uh, South African situation. And in both those situations, it's actually, um, it seems actually then it, uh, uh, sort of moderated a bit by the fact that London was trying to keep racism out of those countries, right? Right, right. Yeah. So going back to California uh, or that area, and, and I would just throw in one other factor on the Coolism. You know, Mary Coolidge had written for the for the immigration, the thing about cool, coolie labor. And uh, that was affecting how it would uh, uh, bar uh, um, US from trading that and trading in that. So, but she uses the example of Cuba and South Africa, right? And in the sugar, sugar industries and other things like that. Uh, so there is a sort of virtual slavery in the coolism she documented in those countries, but not in the United States. Right, right. Mary Coolidge was very clear that uh, Chinese in America were not coolies. Yeah. So let me, let me, so that's an interesting question about the indentured labor of the coolies in Cuba. Um, well, let me just address that first. I think that's actually really interesting because I think if you look at Chinese emigration in the 19th century, you have one stream that goes to the plantation colonies um, under indentured contracts. And that's just not just Chinese, but also people from India, right? Who are being mobilized by the British. Um, and uh, so that's a kind of replacement labor for slaves, right? After emancipation. But, you know, and um, and then the, the other big stream, which is actually larger, is that that those immigrants who go to the Anglo-American settler societies like Australia, the United States, right, Canada, et cetera. And those are voluntary immigrants. They don't go under contracts. And so that's why by 
tarring them as coolies was a, a big disservice to their, their political standing and their potential. But what's interesting is that, you know, there are now a few people who are working on Chinese in the uh, indenture and also South Asian indenture who are also pushing back on this coolieism. They don't deny that they went under contracts, but they're saying this, this coolie is this notion of being coolies also robs them of their communities, of their identities as and cultures and their family practices. And because they were under contracts, when their contracts ended, a lot of them stayed and became property owners, mm -hmm. merchants, you know, or wage workers, you know, they had so there's actually this little pushback from, from that um, region of scholarship and research as saying, well, let's let's actually look at them again, because if they were so pathetically oppressed like slaves, how can they just like within a few years after their contracts are finished be this vibrant community, right? There's like a little bit of a disconnect there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't so that's that, really interesting. Yeah. I, I just wanted to bring in the modern day issue here in the US uh, of uh, the many millions of illegal people that are right, exactly. currently in the country. Um, many of them did come as workers, uh, temporary workers, and then stayed. The Bracero program brought in right. many, many folks who then ended up you know, settling in the country. Um, and today we have anywhere from 11 to 20 million estimated illegal people. And the interesting thing with the laws today are that we actually created laws that prevent these people from leaving by creating a three-year bar to their re-entering or for most of them, if they've been here more than one year illegally, 10-year bar from coming back, thereby effectively preventing these people from actually leaving the country and binding them into this society. And, and then we add insult to that injury by preventing them from getting legal employment authorization by passing laws that say only legal the legally employable people with authorization can work. Uh, and so are we actually creating a sort of yeah. indentured servitude uh, of these people who have no other alternative and can't work legally? And so they work under the table and are taken advantage of. Right, and right. How I think that's, similar yeah. is that to the Chinese experience uh, in all of these countries after they arrived and when they didn't find the gold, for example, and started assimilating into the community. Right, right. And, and That's a really great insight. Um, and I think to me, it points to the problem is when you, when you um, identify a group by a certain kind of legal status, like mm -hmm. they're illegals mm -hmm. right. or they're coolies or they're mm -hmm. indentured, it kind of overtakes their identity and it, it puts them in a second class or you know um, marginal position, um, and it's a way of it's a way of racializing them, right? As being othering them, and you're absolutely right that th these are often created by the very laws that um, that are passed. Yeah, and not, not to turn it to politics, but someone in our Q and A, you know, they asked if the past presidential administration um, was using a similar political analysis for, for as a playbook. Do you think yeah. that, is it intentional or is it just you know, a product of what's been learned from the past? Or? Well, it certainly is clearly one example of how over a four year period an administration could turn what was effectively a welcoming nation into a nation that effectively said, we don't want you here uh, to immigrants worldwide. And they actually took many, many steps that the Biden administration is now undoing, which effectively prevented people who were legally allowed or should have been legally allowed to come from coming into the country. Uh, and I, I think the U.S. is a, 
a little different from many of these other countries that have predominantly a native population, and then you introduce the Chinese or the Indians or others that come in to those societies, and then they get obviously treated differently because they are different looking. But in the US, we have a very, very different situation. We're very mixed in that sense uh, over the last uh, 200 years. So is this, is this scenario, is it more uh, endemic to colonized countries? Is, is, that, is that part of the equation? The, the well, this is, re this, is re this is related to um, Ted's earlier question about white men's countries, yeah. right? About South Africa and Australia unabashedly calling themselves white men's countries. And, and did we have that in the United States? And I think we did have that until the Civil War. They were just as unabashed before the Civil War. And the Civil War changes everything because after the Civil War, the, you know, uh, the con constitutional amendments declare that slavery is no longer, that black people are citizens and that they have equal rights and they have the right to vote. And so there's now, then there's a big struggle over, are you gonna make good on that, right? Are you gonna make good on that? And the history of constitutional rulings on black civil rights is one where the rights keep getting denied, but it's all through kind of euphemism because they can't come out and say they're inferior, right? They can't contradict the 14th amendment. So they come up with, you know, legal fictions like separate but equal, so, right? Oh, the so they have to dance around the constitution to suppress civil rights. And that's where the Chinese get stuck because once they decide they're not gonna honor the 14th amendment for black people, you can forget about Chinese, you know what I mean? It's Chinese are gonna, are gonna suffer in the wake of that. And I don't wanna go on and on, but I wanna, I wanna reference a speech that Frederick Douglass gave and maybe Ted, because you're a Frederick Douglass. Uh, I think that's wonderful that you're a Frederick Douglass uh, honoree. Um, he made this great speech in 1869 over Chinese exclusion. And he said, yeah, let them come. Yes. He says, doesn't matter, millions come, let them come. We'll welcome them, we should welcome them because yeah, China is a poor country and they're gonna wanna come. And he says, migration is a human right. That's right. And we are a composite nation and we should welcome them. And if we welcome them, they'll become just like us. Mm -hmm. And he basically said the United States had a choice, right? It could become a democracy where, based on equality for everybody, or it be could become a society of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And we know which choice, which direction it took, right, in after the Civil War. So I think these things are all connected. And, you know, we still face a choice today. We face the same choice today. Are we going to be a democracy? Or are we going to be a society based on white supremacy and inequality? Yeah, of course, what um, all these other countries, uh, even when they had the white Australian policy, would say we're democracy, but it's democracy for the white for, for whites, right? Yeah. Exactly. But, the, right. but I want to get back to some of the. Uh, there's so much nuance in your books. <laughs> if you compare the three uh, the, the three locations we're talking about, and if you're talking about as Prakash says that there are bars in the America that. Pre that create situations and cause people to be third class, second class, or other sub-citizens and so forth. But one of the things about America is that uh, even in our current immigration laws, it's that you can still uh, adjust status. Uh, you're allowed to do all this other stuff. But one of the things that I see in say the three locations that we're talking about is while they may profess a desire to be manifestly all white or it's white America or it's going to be uh, uh, the apartheid that uh, South Africa eventually develops is that there is the difference between many of the United States and other is the United States still has an opportunity to become somehow integrated in this country. So I think I saw and I may be wrong about this but in the Africa case 
compared to Australia. Australia was moderated a bit by London and desired not to appear racist, right? But the uh, how does that affect it? We're talking about a current day Bracero program or other like the Philippine Overseas Employment Association. How much can we learn from these other examples that says you should not put restrictions on the ability of the person to just stay, if, if in the American case, just adjust status. You should not put restrictions on their ability to bring families or to go back and forth. Can we relate that and get an example of uh, what, what uh, from the Australian case, particularly, I think, uh, this is so stark. <laughs> and then the, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, South African case is so stark. Well, the South African case is unique because the South African case is driven really by the so-called native question, right? To be a white man's country where whites are outnumbered by native Africans six to one um, requires a really heavy duty, right? Apparatus, right? So the interesting thing is in the early 20th century, when the Chinese are recruited to work in the gold mines, the native question isn't settled yet. You know, the um, apartheid as a system isn't enacted until the 1940s, but even the Native Land Act, which removed natives from their traditional lands and put them in, you know, so-called reserves, um, that's not till 1913. And so things like, um, the land dispossession, the forced removal of natives to these um, so-called homelands or tribal reserves and the use of um, a past system. Uh, so they would be kind of uh, so-called commuters to work for the whites. You know, that doesn't get implemented till um, the 1910s and even the 1920s. So a lot of the reason why the Chinese question was so volatile in South Africa was because what whites were afraid of was that Chinese were going to creep into skilled jobs because they were all recruited as manual labor, but they were afraid that they would creep up into semi-skilled and skilled jobs. And the real fear is that black people would do that, right? That black Africans would do that. That's, that was what it portended to them. But you know, one of the right? things that I found really fascinating in that chapter was how systematic the government was to actually go out through <laughs> Chinese. And the question was, and they still had that ability to maybe recruit uh, African-Americans to the north part of Africa, not South Africa. Why don't, why not go there? And I think there are sections that talk about them coming down south to work. Why and how did you come about creating that process of bringing in workers under these contracts and so forth? Right, 60,000 Chinese. 60,000 Chinese. And then right <laughs> 5, after. 5,000 miles away. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask you also, right after 1907 and that, they all disappear. They send back all the contracts and just kick them yep. out or what was it? Yeah, they made them go back. They yeah. made them all go back. So it'd be interesting to explain um, yeah. how, because they had, it looked like the Chinese government and even the local government, they set up the laws, try to put protection clauses in those things. Right, right, right. 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 And so that relates to the idea of, do we restart another Bracero program? Do we restart uh, 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 the uh, other guest worker programs, that kind of stuff like that? And will they succeed? I hope not. I hope we won't. I hope the United States doesn't do that. Yeah. Well, the Chinese, uh, the importation of Chinese labor to South Africa was after um, the South African war. So uh, the gold gold production had really uh, basically stopped during the war, and it was very difficult for them to get native labor um, after the war um, because the one one um, supply which came from uh, Portuguese East Africa, which is now Mozambique, that was disrupted. That supply was disrupted by the war, and local uh, native Africans in um, in South Africa, in the Transvaal, um, were reluctant to work in the mines. They didn't want to. They wanted to stay on their farms, you know. Um, and so it was very difficult for them to get the mine started. And first, they wanted to get workers from India. And now that made sense because they had already been 
importing Indians on indenture to work on the sugar plantations in the Natal. But India said, you can't have people go on contract and forcibly make them go home afterwards. They have to have the right to stay. And South white South Africans were already upset that so many Indians had stayed in the Natal. So they wanted to forcibly have labor go back. And so India said, no, we're not gonna do that. So they went to China and, um, and, and you know, one, one minor figure in my book who shows up, who enables some of this recruitment is Herbert Hoover, who was a mining engineer with um, experience in China and South Africa and London. And he helped put that whole program together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the after the Great War, or around the time you have all these labor movements going on, and of course, uh, one of the great uh, uh, independence people there that comes out of South Africa is Mahatma Gandhi, right? Right. There is, right. Can you talk a little bit about that uh, Chinese uh, sort of collaboration or? or working with him during those strikes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gandhi was active at the very same time in the first decade of the 20th century uh, mm -hmm. in the same area in, uh, in the Transvaal. Um, he was a, a young lawyer in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at first the Indian civil rights movement and the Chinese movement um, were not connected. They didn't really understand each other, they had different concerns, you know, um, but, uh, and, and the Chinese civil rights uh, in South Africa was not from the miners, it was not from the mining laborers, it was from Chinese merchants who were um, aggrieved by the same laws that affected South Asian merchants, you know, like, un you know, unfair taxes, a lot of restrictions on where they could um, ply their trades, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, Eventually, the two get together and um, they go to jail. They protest together. They go to jail together um, and they appreciate each other. But they always had a different kind of, I think, outlook because their kind of political origins were so different, right? Um, the Indians really being uh, identifying as part of the British Empire and wanting their rights as British subjects. Mm -hmm. Right, and the Chinese didn't have that outlook because they were not colonized by Great Britain. Right. Interesting. Well, one of the interesting things to look at uh, when we look at today's, uh, I mean, current situation here in the U.S. is how, you know, we're, we're a little different here in the United States because obviously the children that are born are actually granted for citizenship rights, whereas in many of these countries that did not occur and laws were, uh, would prevent the children and their children from getting full citizenship rights. And so obviously with the Chinese, when they migrated through, some of these restrictive laws prevented the children from assimilating as well. Whereas in the US, we've had a slightly different approach where uh, you know, you may get a generation, the immigrant generation, that has to deal with all of these issues. Uh, because uh, as they become citizens, many of them have been, uh, in, for example, in the South, we've got laws that are passed on vagrancy and things of that sort that basically uh, create uh, criminality in these people right, who eventually right. will become citizens but have no voting rights because they've got all these crimes that were created for that community that then prevent them from assimilating. Whereas uh, what we have, and we have that same thing here with that first generation, but beyond that first generation, the next generation assimilates completely uh, because they are not subjected to those kinds of rules and regulations. Uh, whereas in the other countries that you talk about, I think that's, how, that, that's where the distinction was, is that you know, there was that um, inability for that next generation to assimilate. And so the problem continued for many more generations. Is that something you saw or was that something uh, in your research 
Yeah, you know, one interesting difference between Australia and the United States is that in California, there were anti-miscegenation laws, right? This is something that is, um, you know, is, comes directly from anti-Black uh, laws. Uh, and they add the Chinese um, and other Asians uh, to those, as well as other laws that get passed in the West Coast around, you know, owning certain businesses or professional licenses or agricultural property. You know, there's a whole range of anti-Asian laws. But the anti-miscegenation laws means that um, uh, until or unless Chinese men can bring over wives, they have, it's very hard to establish a community, right? Um, and in Australia, they didn't have anti-miscegenation laws. And so there weren't a, a ton of them, but there were Chinese men who married Irish women or English women um, and had families. And they tended to be the more um, middle-class types, you know, people who maybe owned a small business um, or who parlayed their relationship with white networks, right, into better economic and political position. So going back to the, you know, 1860s and, and 50s in Australia, you have um, a greater establishment of a, of a community and, and actually until the white Australia policy in 1901, um, Chinese could uh, naturalize, they could vote. Um, and Chinese who came to Australia from other British colonies, those who came from Hong Kong or Singapore were considered British subjects. So they had rights as British subjects. And so there were instances when uh, you know, white governments in Australia tried to um, refuse Chinese arriving on ships to land. And a lot of them were British subjects. And they said, you can't refuse us because we're, we're British subjects. So in a curious way, even though Australia was un unabashedly a white man's country, there were um, in some ways better laws that protected the Chinese or enabled them to build communities in ways that was more difficult in the United States. You know, I want to go, uh, so we're coming close to the hour, but I wanted to sort of like combine <laughs> some questions here. Maybe, I, I don't know how successful I can do that. But the, um, uh, some people were sort of uh, wanting a chronological sort of uh, background to the, the three migration locations because they, do, they don't occur at the same time. Uh, uh, California in the West Coast, early 1840s, beginning in 1880s. Then you get into Australia, which comes in the later period, but still within the 1900s and then uh, 1800s. So then you get into Australia. And then that's relevant to this other question, is the effectiveness of, say, the Qing government or other people to protect it. So we begin with almost no definitions or racism or it's why it really is the wild west right and then you have uh you have uh, the banning led by the british government the london that says let's ban coolism let's ban and of course uh, slavery is ended by the 14th amendment in, in, in theory <laughs> then, but you have these arguments that are transferred over to australia and trying to uh, the responsible government trying to enact that and then us uh, and then uh, South Africa has all kinds of problems because local politics in London in, in, in truth. But also what I was really struck with in, in, in your narratives of how effective actually the Chinese government was, at least that part that was the, moder the modernizing part, the Sigli Yaman and things of this sort. And that played a part probably in having people that can articulate protections for the Chinese and so forth by the various envoys that were sent out. In the end, they had, they, 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 they got kicked out of the Qing government for various different things. But that does speak to the idea that many people have. That the, hello. My little grandson is coming in. <laughs> but uh, it does speak to the fact that there he is. <laughs> the effectiveness of, a, of, a, of a, the Chinese government and how to protect it. And maybe a lot of these things are, are have occurred or been prevented from occurring because of the rise 
or the weaknesses of the Chinese government then and then its rise to position now. Can you comment a bit about yeah, that? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was um, one of the key criticisms made by Chinese reformers um, in the 1890s and the early 20th century. One of the big criticisms they made about the Qing was that they could not protect Chinese abroad, mm -hmm. right? That there were all these laws passed against them and uh, riots and violence, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is, um, and that, that, that it kind of, they symbolized China's backwardness and weakness, right, in the world. And I think that's true and not true. You know, there's some truth to that because China was weak in the international relations. You know, it was um, uh, bullied by foreign nations. Mm -hmm. It didn't have respect abroad. So it was difficult, but I will say that they tried as inexperienced as they were in foreign diplomacy um, uh, of the Western type and as weak as they were, they tried. And so their um, diplomats, I mean, they sent cons consuls to, to the United States um, and to uh, South Africa, they sent consuls and they, you know, somebody asked me a question about Yip Wo, Yip Wo v. Hopkins, the 1880s. That case was brought by the Qing Council in San Francisco, Huang mm -hmm. Zunxian. He brought that case. He, it was a test case. Mm -hmm. All these Chinese law cases are test cases, just like the NAACP brings test cases. Right. Same with the Chinese cases. And Huang Junxian brought the test case in the, to protest the laundry law, right, which said that... Um, you had to have your laundry built made of brick. And if it was of wood, you could get an exemption, but they gave no exemptions to Chinese. Yeah. And so, and he was the one who used habeas to force the case. Because when they sued, when, when they, they got him, a when the owner of the Yikwo laundry was arrested, they figured, oh, this is gonna take forever for this case to go through. So they used habeas to force the court to address the question. And so they were very, savvy, I think, legally in, um, in protesting not just that law, but uh, uh, other cases uh, in lower courts. And the reason why that case won is not because the court had any great love for the Chinese, it's because Stephen Field in particular, but the court was interested in expanding the rights under the 14th Amendment to economic activity. That was their real motive. And the Chinese offered them an occasion to rule that the 14th Amendment applied to uh, business, right, to economic activity. Yeah. Yeah. So Chinese lost most of the most of their cases, <laughs> all the immigration cases they lose, but they they won the citizenship case, right, Wang right. Kim Ark. They won Wong that Kim case Ark. in 1898 because the court said, well, you know, if we don't give birthright citizenship to the Chinese, we put in jeopardy all the Europeans who came and had children here. That's right. That's right. It was especially important because, you know, facially uh, neutral, you know, it, it, it says that discrimination can come by the fact that I have to close the door. <laughs> May, would, would, dis, would the discrimination that we've seen against Chinese in America, would it, would it would have really happened on the scale that it did if, um, there wasn't this political machine behind it and people like um, like Dennis Kearney and, and you know, like people that were really just so fixed on using, um, you know, racism as a, as, a, as a political tool, like weaponizing it, I guess. Well, you know, I think there's, there's this kind of symbiosis between popular racism and elite racisms. You know, Kearney and the mob, they give, they make everything edgier, right? Um, and they give, uh, and they're used by the politicians. You know, Carney starts the Working Man's Party in California and they, they sweep these elections for the state constitution, but the Working Man's Party gets co-opted by the Democrats, you know, like in two minutes, yeah. right? And, and they, they, so they use this kind of popular base of racism to support their own ends. But I think that it's not, um, they're not dry. I don't think they're driving it. It's it's more that there's elite interests. Mm -hmm. So I, I, just I like, like just like today. Right. I, I, 
yeah, this one, this one sense you wrote here, a very, a number of well-written statements here. Uh, you know, the Chinese question was fueled by popular racism, theorized by elite thinkers and weaponized by politicians. I think that covers us so much in there. But right, the, uh, right. But then I, you know, I want to, uh, we're heading, like I said, we're going to be closing the show out, but I just want to go back to the fundamental question is what was the Chinese question? Because I think you make a, a, a tremendous yeah. <laughs> image to questions that it's not so much uh, racism is an aspect of, of a global or an emerging global economy built on the gold standard and then beyond that. And then I want to go back to another quote you have, which is, uh, uh, what was the question, Chinese question and what is the Chinese question today? Because you says the Chinese question has been revived and repurposed for 20th, uh, the 21st century. So can you go back and say, what is the Chinese question then? Right, what is okay. the question today and how does it? How does it right, right, right. Okay, yeah. I, maybe we should have said that in the very top. Yeah. Uh, the Chinese question was simply, are Chinese uh, a menace? to white societies in the West, to West to the West, and should they be excluded from them? Should be, they be barred? And in the 19th century, that's a radical idea because in the 19th century, everything's based on free migration and free trade. Mm -hmm. And so then you have a global movement to say that there's one group of people we're gonna keep out of our countries and they build this great wall around China, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of a, a kind of reorganization of the world, right? Not, both in terms of pop, the politics and the economics are related, right? Because it's all about China being, you know, the West is forcibly entering China after the opium wars, right? But it's also trying to contain China, to keep China from being uh, an equal player in international affairs and in global, uh, global economic affairs. So you could say that today you have a kind of revival of the Chinese question you know, Chinese in, um, and today China is obviously in a different position than the Qing, right? China is now a global economic power and it's nipping at the heels of the United States, which is still the number one economic power. But, you know, that horse has left the barn. You know, China is uh, an economic and geopolitical force that has to be reckoned with. And I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight. I'm not for China or for the United States. I think they both have done a lot of things that are not constructive. Um, but uh, the Chinese question, how, how does, so, how, so it's obviously about competition with China, right? I think, well, to me, it's obvious that what fuels a lot of it is American competition with China. And, um, and this is where, you know, I'll just say that the Biden administration, while he has been very clear to oppose anti-Asian racism and violence, He's continuing a lot of the anti-China policies of the Trump administration. So he's kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth, right? But, you know, let me just say this. Chinese, not just Chinese, but Asian Americans are less than 6% of the U.S. population. Less than 6%. And yet, how many white people think there's too many Asians in America? There's just too many. There's too many at Harvard. There's too many in California. There's too many in Georgia. There's just too many, right? Six less than 6%. And it's the fastest growing Im immigrant uh, stream, but 6% is not gonna become, you know, like what, what do they think it's gonna become? You know, so this whole um, idea of the yellow peril is just beneath the surface that they think Chinese is that much of a danger, right? To American society. And May is not a remnant of the late 19th century uh, sentiment, or is it just that it organically keeps resurfacing? Well, in new it has to be, yeah, it has to be reproduced. It's not the same as it was in the 19th century, but a lot of the kind of deep-seated ideas are repurposed and, and brought out and serve similar ends. I, I don't think it's a one continuous you know, stream of racism goes up and down. It's, you know, like during the Vietnam War, it had a very distinctive flavor, right? About gooks and, you know, cheapness of Asian life, you know, that was very prominent during the Vietnam War. But it's interesting, you know, how you see the coolie 
uh, reappear, right? Who are the coolies today? They're the factory workers in Shenzhen, right? Who are like robots, um, cheap labor. And they're the Asian American college students who study too hard, right? Who are uh, put white kids at a disadvantage because they're not normal, right? They just study all the time. They're like, that's another coolie figure, right? That's a, you know, um, and they're and they're just driven by, you know, they're under the whip of either the Communist Party in China or the Tiger Mothers in America, right? Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> you see the the same kind of uh, root image yeah. kind of uh, reappearing in a different form. Yeah, so much. Uh so much directions that we can take this. So it's, uh, it's really unfortunate that uh, we've actually gone past a couple of minutes and of, our, 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 of our program. But I wonder if uh, Prakash, uh, David, would you like to say a couple words and then we'll leave the Yeah, final. you know, I, I really, obviously we're, we're building this museum about uh, Chinese American history and, and you know, part of it is the story of exclusion. And uh, I have to say, this book has really given me a little tilt shift on the way I uh, look at um, uh, a lot of that history. And I think really for the better, because, you know, you as a museum, I think you really try to simplify the history in some ways, because it has to be digestible for the public. But, you know, you realize that it is very, it's very complex and it's, um, and there's, there really is no one linear explanation for it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank, so thank you for writing this book. I think it's really uh, a great treasure for us. Across, any quick closing remarks? Uh, you're probably muted. You got, unmute yourself. I'm looking forward to uh, May's next book because uh, hopefully she will tie in the American experience uh, that we're having today with Chinese Americans and with uh, other uh, minorities that are here, Asian Americans in general, and also Latin Americans, and how, you know, we can move to a different place by changing our laws and how we can maybe become a more wholesome society. Uh, moving forward and how do we accomplish that using all of this history uh, as a base for moving forward and right. obviously the Chinese American Museum there uh, you will certainly be helpful and the 1882 foundation will clearly be uh, a major player in this. Yeah and uh, may I'm going to give you the last couple words before I sort of close out a little bit. Uh, there's the book everybody should get a copy. <laughs> a couple of a couple of words and then I just say a little bit about our series and what we have planned. Uh, there are so many questions uh, that I wish we had a t- chance to go through the chat function and I'm so sorry for not having been able to get to 12. May, some quick words. Well, somebody wrote in the chat, um, is there any hope? Do we have any words of hope or inspiration for those fighting against modern anti-Chinese sentiment? And, you know, we live in very dangerous times. You know, it's, it's, it's dark, <laughs> but I think we have to be hopeful. We have to, um, we have to keep educating people, educating ourselves and our neighbors, and we have to practice solidarity with other groups and expect that they will be in solidarity with us. And, um, and we, we have to, you know, right now, this country is facing a really grave crisis of, of our basic dem- democracy, mm-hmm. right? The vote itself is under threat. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, but I do think that, you know, like Frederick Douglass said in 1869, we have a choice. Mm-hmm. We all have a choice um, individually and as a nation. And so that's where I find hope that you know we will keep struggling and you know we will prevail sooner or later well that's great so <laughs> the uh i want to thank you again may and also the david oi particularly the chinese american uh, uh museum and prakash for participating this in this i also want to thank uh, uh panda express for helping support this program this series 
uh, the series is uh, we call the Timeless Echo series. And it's occasional, occasional presentations where we, uh, we actually are trying to find topics that are, are issues of today and use the history to bring out those, uh, those issues. And May, there is so much in this book that we didn't get to. Uh, the, the, that I wish that we would have more time and maybe we could figure out another way to get you on the discussion. Anyway, the uh, time is- Thank you for having me. Oh, no, and apps, thank you for joining us. But anyway, the Time is Echo series is about that. It, it, it is complementary to our talk story events, which are monthly events. The next uh, monthly event we have on time on talk story will be uh, two weeks from now. Uh, and that will be with the 1882 uh, website. Yeah, take a look at that. That's going to be a talk by a, uh, a, uh, a, an expert on uh, Chinese that we don't know about very much. And that's going to be Chinese in the Napa Valley. Uh, people who are working not in the gold mines or in, well, working in the gold mines and railroad, but beyond that, the fishing industry, the agriculture industry, wine industry. And so that would be for the time of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, talk story programs. For Timeless Echoes, uh, stay tuned. We have a couple of things. And again, thank you for Panda Express for helping us out. Uh, we're going to have one which we call Quirky. It will be about Quirky Lee, and it will be on May 10. And that will be done in conjunction with uh, co sponsorship with the Martin Luther King Library and with uh, Asian American Journalists Association. And we'll be talking about uh, his legacy. And we purposely chose Martin May, May 10. Uh, because that is the anniversary of Transcontinental Railroad. And everyone who knows Corky before his passing knows that he, for the last three years, he always assembled all these uh, people together at Promontory to show that uh, we, we are not absent from the American history and that he wanted to show that each year by going May 10 to Promontory to take a, take a photo. But we're going to be doing a short film that uh, Curtis Chan and the... Uh, uh, has produced about Porky, and we'll be having a journalist talking about that, uh, his legacy and so forth. So stay tuned for that. That will be May 10. Then in August, uh, late August, we're going to have a program, date yet to be determined, also be part of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of a partnership, both with uh, Cam DC and also with uh, Martin Luther King Library, and uh, hopefully a couple of other people that will be joining us. But what we're going to be producing is a uh, gathering of uh, film producers who all focused on made films or documentaries about Chinese Americans in uh, the South. Either is uh, uh, two of them on during the period of Jim Crow South, and another one just sort of generally about Chinese Americans in the South. What we're looking for in these series is trying to bring people together to talk about intersections uh, where communities intersected and talked about. So that is coming up in mid, uh, mid or late August. And that is something to look forward. So I wanna thank you and for uh, supporting us. And I also wanna thank the CAMDC and Panda Express for helping us all out support these things. And I especially wanna thank all those people that came. We had almost 300 people attend this session at its high point. And this kind of uh, response is very helpful for us because it helps us feel like we're actually doing something that people want to hear about. So thank you all for participating. Watch, watch, watch our, our, our websites. CamDC's got the best one, <laughs> the best connections, <laughs> but also, uh, also this watch. This will be on our YouTube channel. This yes, and it'll be on the YouTube channel. So watch for that. So 1882 Foundation, uh, we are building uh, a new things too. And so watch us and help us. And again, Thank you so much for Louisa and also May. Thank you so much. You're always, always welcome to come talk and share ideas. That's where you can buy her book. That's her book uh, on the screen. Uh, so get it. It's got so much more information than we <laughs> about. <laughs> thank you so much, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you David very much. And Prakash. Good evening. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Okay, thanks. I'm going to track down my grandson right now. <laughs> <laughs> David, thanks a lot. All right, there. Take care. Prakash, we'll see you later. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm.